I thought I would come back and uh, post another video that, uh, that might be helpful. Um, if you've been to my YouTube channel, you know that I recorded a series of videos that detail my experience with chronic hives or chronic urticaria and the strategies that I use to get back into remission when I have a, uh, a flare-up. Uh, when I put these videos together initially, I uh, posted them to several Facebook groups that I belong to. Uh, these are Facebook support groups where people are just you know, talking about the condition and what they, what they did to help uh, with it. And uh, one of the groups that I posted to is called Chronic Urticaria Solution Seekers. And, um, and I, I like this group a lot because they're all about the naturopathic solutions. And in my experience, if you've seen the videos, was that medications just did not work for me. You know, I, I tried everything and, and it wasn't having success. So I was really researching a lot of, you know, natural solutions, like what, what else can I pursue? And um, in that particular group, their content and discussion was really focused on on more the naturopathic side of things. So they were, they were really helpful uh, in my research. And um, what I posted in there, one of the admins, um, who's a uh, functional medicine coach uh, named uh, Muriel Wagner, reached out uh, just to say that, you know, there was a lot in the videos that aligned to some of the principles that they use in, in functional medicine. And she asked if, it, if I'd be interested in doing an interview um, uh, on their Facebook group, um, just to talk about it and so so we did that and you know people it was a live session so people joined in with some of their questions and, and so forth so it was an interesting chat in that it, it expanded on what I covered in my own videos and and then of course Muriel brought a lot to the conversation too just in terms of uh, you know uh, her knowledge and, and what she knows about uh, hives and, and how functional medicine relates to the treatment of hives and so forth so um, so it's an interesting conversation so I thought I'd go ahead and throw a recording of that up on here uh, in case um, it's helpful. So, uh, so yeah, here you go. Hopefully, uh, hopefully there's something that is of value. Take care. Very cool. Cool. So we've got a couple of people on. Hi, Bonnie. It's amazing to me that this is uh, even possible. You know, like it's, uh, we, we all take the technology for granted. We use it every day, but it's, yeah. it's amazing to me. Uh, here I am in Toronto. There you are in Zurich, you know, and anybody <laughs> from around the, uh, the, from around the world can feel free to just join in. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's, it's just amazing to me. <laughs> well, it's great. I mean, you and I would never have come in and connected either if it had not been for Facebook and the beauty of groups and, you know, yeah. trying to solve a problem in a group wonderful yeah 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 truly I've, I've connected to a bunch of people on, on the various Facebook groups and and it's always several messages in before you realize wow I'm talking to somebody in a like completely different place you know yeah. Yeah. but it happens all the time like it's uh, uh yeah it's really amazing cool well I hope that more people jump on because this is a free service I mean you and I are not getting paid for any of this and we're just trying to share our experiences um, to help the people because we know what a horrible <laughs> condition this is to have. So Scott, you are part of quite a few different Facebook groups and um, shared your journey through a YouTube video in our group and I thought, you know, I watched it just to see what you did and there were so many overlaps with what we do in functional medicine that I thought, you know, here we have another person doing exactly what they should be doing to discover how to reverse hives. And, and yours took quite a while. So do you want to give us a little bit of background as to how long ago the hives started and what were the circumstances under what it started? Can you remember as far back um, as well? Yeah. So the first experience for me was quite a long time ago. <clears throat> it was in the, in the 90s and I was in my 20s. And um, they started slowly, like like most people, right? You notice a couple bumps, and then it got out of control. Probably saw about five different doctors before I even had a diagnosis. Uh, nobody really knew what it was. Um, yeah, and then um, back then I had them. I would say very severely for for about seven years. It was just a daily thing, um, and uh, you know did as much research as I can. I mean, at the time there was just less available online and, and so forth. Um, so it was a matter of just finding, you know, different techniques and things. And I had, had this sort of patchwork of stuff that, that finally got me out of them and, and into remission. 
and and uh, but then I had a long period. It was probably I was over I guess it was about about fifteen years where um, they were essentially gone. Every now and, okay. yeah, every now and then they'd flare up like just a little yeah. bit. But I'd go back to the techniques that I used before. But I I kind of slowly forgot them to be honest. Okay. And then they came back about four years ago, and I didn't pay attention to them. I was really busy. It was just a busy time of life. I had a lot going on. And I didn't do what I always did before. And that was get all over it, nip it in the bud when mm -hmm. it was just a small little outbreak. And I just didn't do that. And they got out of control. And then I think it might have been either uh, a more stressful time of life. You know, uh, I, had, I had family, a very busy job, all this stuff, or just being older. You know, I'm pushing 50 now and, you know, the body changes. So it mm -hmm. could have been, could have been that too, but it, I found this time it was harder and I had forgotten a lot of what I'd learned before. So I kind of went through all the same research again, but, um, but learned a lot more because there's just a lot more out there now. Um, it's easy to connect to people and resources on online. So, so that's where I really sort of fleshed out, remembered a lot of the old stuff and then brought in a lot of new stuff. Uh, and, and that's what fed those series of videos is everything that we, you know, that I yep. pieced together over the years. So yep. it was kind of a, a long journey, but all together about 24 years, something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, you mentioned going to a lot of doctors because this is the position where I think a lot of people are. So they, they start experiencing the hives and then they start going to the doctors to try and find out what this is and how to get rid of them. So you said you, you, you went to see about five different doctors. What kind of doctors were you seeing and what were the answers you were getting from them? Uh, so I, I would have started uh, with a general practitioner uh, in, in Canada. That's basically how, how it works for everything. Uh, so you, you go see your GP, your general practitioner, and they recommend uh, the suitable expert. And uh, so my first doctor was um, an allergist. And, uh, and that person gave me a, a list of, uh, he gave me a prescription for antihistamines and, um, and told me to stay away from tomatoes, cheese, he gave me a list of like four or five foods and, 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 you know, things, things just continued to, to get worse. I saw him several times. And then the, the next doctor was, I, it was just another allergist because he had, um, uh, he was shifting clinic or something. And there was a secondary doctor, same, same kind of advice. Um, and, uh, and then there was a third allergist. Uh, back then it was all allergists essentially. And, uh, and then it wasn't until my recent experience that uh, I saw uh, an immunologist. There's a, there's a doctor here in Toronto, um, Grossman, Dr. Grossman, who's sort of Toronto's hive guy. Okay. Uh, he has a research mm -hmm. clinic mm -hmm. and uh, they, they do uh, Zolaire injections there and, uh, and he's just focused uh, on that exclusively. Um, they're very much um, into the, you know, the, the, the medications and, and, and the prescription world. Uh, he didn't, um, you know, he, he was, he was really good in that I'd, I'd come in telling him all the naturopathic stuff I was exploring and he, and he would say, well, that's great. You know, keep, keep doing that. If it's working for you, that's great. But he wasn't keen to explore it or talk about it or, or anything like that. Um, I, I really, um, yeah, it, it was, if I'm thinking back the type of doctors, yeah, it was, it was primarily allergists and then finally the immunologist. And then I went myself into the naturopathic side of things. And that's when things got really interesting for me because, um, and this may be a Canadian medical system thing, but, but the doctors are overworked, they're really busy and there's a turnover factor. So as soon as you get into the office, things are moving fast and, mm -hmm. and the questions mm -hmm. come fast and the answers come fast and then you're out. Yeah. Whereas talking to I the think it's not, it's not <laughs> unique to Canada at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> It's the conventional um, medicine, medicine model. Sorry, I've got a dog scratching the door. I'm just going to let him in. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the uh, the naturopath, um, you know, speaking to folks in, in that profession specifically, the there's just so much more curiosity. There's more time to talk. There's more questions. And, and that really started creating connections between things. And, mm -hmm. uh, and that's, I mean, that's what this kind of thing really needs because every, everybody's different. Like I'm different, sure the triggers yeah. and the drivers are all yeah. over the map. So uh, yeah, really, um, yeah, it, it was really a different experience. And that's when things really started to improve because it sort of married, 
you know, the research that I was doing obsessively, <laughs> as you do when you have something like this. Absolutely. And, yeah. yeah, and 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 putting together, you know, uh, specific treatment plans, opening uh, my eyes to things I didn't know about, and, and supplements and stuff like that. So it, it so, was a huge did, difference. So you only started exploring changes in diet. Um, when you started meeting with the naturopath. So as far as I understand, when you were meeting with allergists or immunologists, they were, I'm guessing, um, prescribing steroid yeah. and yeah. antihistamines. Right. Yeah, and it, and it was try this, try that, try this, try that. And it was always, you know, try the next thing mm-hmm. and, and, then, mm-hmm. and varying dosage. So, you know, so that didn't work. Let's try a whole lot of it, you know. Okay. Right. And, mm-hmm. uh, and then I, it was just these cycles up and down, but it was always up. It was just getting worse, worse, worse all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, yeah, but all prescription. Yeah. Yeah, I think I've seen that a lot in the group where people have been on meds for a while and then eventually the, the meds stop working for them. So that was your experience as well, and which led you to having yeah. to seek out other answers because you knew you weren't going to get the answers there. Okay. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, and I found that histamines were, or the antihistamines were, had this bizarre effect where I, I really need to wean off them to get into remission. And that was something I learned back in the nineties and, and repeated now it, it um, without weaning off, I would never have gotten into remission. And it's, mm-hmm. I don't mm-hmm. understand the, the mechanism behind yeah. that because antihistamines are not, they, they don't set up any kind of addictive cycle that I've ever read about. And then I've mm-hmm. been deep down that research rabbit hole, but there's something about it. Maybe it's psychological. I don't know, but th- that, that, you know, that was such a big part of getting into remission for me. It was just slowly, slowly, slowly getting off of the, the antihistamines. Yeah. Well, our um, understanding of the antihistamines is that his, his, um, we, all of our cells have these histamine receptors. And, anti, and so what the antihistamines or the histamine blockers are doing, they're blocking these receptors. And so when, when your body is not able to receive these signals, then it's going to start pushing out the signals even more. <laughs> so right. you're blocking the receptors, but then they're creating more receptors elsewhere. And so eventually, even though you're using more antihistamines, the antihistamines stop becoming effective um, right. with time. That makes so much sense. Yeah. 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 Also, do you want to explain to everyone, I mean, you've, you did an excellent job in the YouTube video of, of taking people through what um, nutrition changes you did. And I thought, um, you know, just during this chat, we can highlight the kind of overlaps between the changes that you did and the changes that we recommend. Um, sure. So do you want to just talk about the first changes that you made and why you decided on those? Yeah, yeah, there were, I, I, there would be four, I think, categories of changes that I made. Um, number one was just uh, staying away from foods that had a lot of histamine in them. Uh, I got a great list, it's, it's, um, it's in the video, but it's, uh, it's just this list of all the foods that either contain histamine or cause histamine to be released in the body. So that was number one, and that, that I think, made the biggest difference um, to uh, making me comfortable. So just getting rid of all the histamines. I kind of thought of things as being a, a formula of how many histamines were in my body and how, and how reactive was I to them. And I, I could control that side of the equation by just pulling another diet. So that, that helped a lot. Um, for whatever reason, and, and there's tons of research out there around it, nightshade vegetables just annoy hives I, I, or fruits and vegetables. But nightshade. Link to, yeah, it's the link to the, the gut lining. So nightshade vegetables um, in general for the immune system tend to be kind of inflammatory and for the gut. So okay. because the gut and the immune system are very strongly linked, yeah. anything that's going to be disturbing your gut um, should be also removed. So that's why nightshades usually help too, especially for autoimmune, we say nightshades also come out. Okay, I, I always wondered because it didn't make sense to me. They they on the surface very healthy foods. And it's yeah, a to lose exactly. Them from your diet, nice vegetables. I mean, tomatoes yeah. for a lot of people like oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, interesting. Um, I'm going to pronounce this wrong, but uh, salicylates, salicylates, salicylates. Um, yeah, it's tomatoes, tomatoes, <laughs> potatoes, yeah. potatoes. <laughs> I don't yeah, know. yeah. I, I I researched that a, a, a ton. It was really interesting for me. It's a, just a, a chemical in the peel, you know, that protects the the, the plant from from insects and stuff. Um, so I I didn't eat any foods that were high in salicylates and or salicylates, and there's a ton of them. 
Uh, mm -hmm. But I would also peel stuff. So, you know, if I was eating like apple, for example, is one of my safe foods on the list, but I would peel it just to okay. make sure I wasn't taking in any of that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and then I had a uh, an IgG sensitivity uh, test done okay. yeah. um, very early on in, in all of this. And it highlighted a bunch of foods that were kind of uh, excluded anyway, really, on the other lists. Um, but, uh, but it pointed to, you know, some potential, uh, IgG sensitivities to, um, anything to do with wheat. So the gliadin was on there, gluten, you know, wheat germ, all that kind of stuff. And, uh, and then dairy as well. And some, some specific things like peas and, and, and nuts and things like that. But, mm -hmm. but the, the getting grains and dairy out, um, yeah. you know, make, made a huge difference for me. And it's where I've gone wrong. Like in the past, I've had doctors put me on like an allergy diet where it's like super restricted, but it had bread on it, you know, like you can't oh, have bread, no problem yeah. or, yeah. or yeah, and, <laughs> and dairy and, and stuff. So it was yeah. like, yeah. I would, in the past, I would be doing these super restricted diets, but then have like these one or two offenders that just kept things going. And I mean, mm -hmm. kept it going mm -hmm. for years, like looking wow. back, it was like, wow. oh, yeah. I'd only know. Yeah. Right? yeah, yeah, exactly. So, I mean, all right, so drawing the parallel on the functional medicine side, so you, you spoke about this histamine level and trying to find that balance or at least re reduce that histamine burden on the body because that's when our body responds is when that burden just becomes too much for our body to handle. And so I always talk about in my masterclasses about having this kind of bucket and we're filling this bucket with stuff and, and it can be toxins or stress and food that affects our bodies and it just fills up. That's why the older you get, the fuller your bucket's going to be because you know you collected over the years many different things whether it be you know glyphosate and in your vegetables or whatever it might be so then when that starts to overflow you start to experience these hives or this histamine overflow and so your your strategy of reducing the histamine load is a good one because then you're just at least not filling the bucket with lots of histamine and so that's one strategy why a lot of people, when they say, okay, there's hives and this is a histamine issue, they say, okay, go on a low histamine diet so that at least you're not feeding the system with too much histamine. But at the same time, you're not addressing the outflow. So our buckets will get cleared by our detoxification system if we have a proper functioning detoxification system. So we'll go get onto that with your supplements but we have two enzymes that clear histamine from the body and that's dao and the other one's hmt and these two if they're working properly usually it's because of gut health um will help you clear histamines but most people have compromised gut health and therefore not producing sufficient enzymes to clear it and so you have the, on the one hand a drain that is blocked and unable to clear and on the other hand you know, the tap is filling lots and lots of things into your histamine bucket. And that's when it starts to overflow. I, I love that analogy because <laughs> that's exactly what it feels like. Because there's times when your yeah. bucket's half full and, yeah. and you have and you that can slice eat of pizza the and you're okay. You yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. But then when the bucket's at the top, man, you shake that bucket at all and it hives <laughs> everywhere. And it, it makes so much sense. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. And that's where we come to that, I think, the third part of your videos where you spoke about the lifestyle and the, re, you know, more the stress management, because that can fill our bucket to some extent, either by slowing the drainage or just, yeah. you know, yeah. Interesting. Um, when the last time I saw my immunologist and, um, and, I, and I was saying, you know, because we were going to do it, we were going to try Zolar again. Didn't work for me before. Mm -hmm. In fact, I reacted to it like crazy. Oh, uh, yeah. um, and, and he, but he wanted to try it again. And, and I was getting some real headway on, on all the approaches that I've run through in the video. And, and I said to him, let's hold on to Zolar to see how things go. And, and we just got chatting. And he said his practice has never been busier. And wow. I thought, I, I said, that's really interesting. You know, why do you think? And he's like, I don't know. And I said, does it have anything, do you think, to do with the fact that we're in the middle of a global pandemic? And there's this baseline level of stress that everybody's experiencing in, in different ways. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. You know, you go to stress models like the Holmes and Ray and, and, and stuff like that. All this stuff has a physical effect. It's just, Absolutely. when does it manifest, right? And it takes yeah, some time. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, but he said, um, yeah, right now is the busiest his practice has ever been. And it, and it had just, you know, started, you know, and uh, I, I think there's a really interesting connection there. 
Totally, totally. Yeah, we'll get on to that. I mean, stress affects our biochemistry, so it's going to fix our hormones as well. Um, so you also mentioned the IgG, and I think that's one thing I'd like to help people understand is because the I'm, I'm guessing, I'm going to check with you, when you went to the allergist or immunologist, the first time you asked for testing if you were allergic to something, were you getting, what kind of tests were they doing? <laughs> oh, it was so funny because, they, so they were doing uh, prick tests. Patch tests. Okay. Yeah, patch mm -hmm. tests. And I remember the first time doing one, actually, because it was hilarious. They said, well, don't take any antihistamines two days before the test. And I said, are you sure? Because like, I'm going to be so reactive. And they're like, oh, no, 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 it'll, it'll ru ruin the test. So don't take any antihistamines. So for two days, I didn't take any antihistamines. When I walked into that office, I yeah. was like a pepperoni pizza. <laughs> my oh, entire wow, yeah. body and, and my, my arm, she's like, I don't even know where to prick because there's yeah. no clear skin. Like, yeah. But she went ahead and did the test. And, yeah. and so I, and my whole arm just turned into a bubble. <laughs> like, oh, wow. Yeah. It was just... So it was, it was not a, a valid test, you know, and, and I, that happened a couple of times. And, and then I did a blood test um, for, and it just didn't, nothing was turning up anything. So no allergies at all, except I did do more recently um, a patch test, mm -hmm. um, which was a little different. And that was more for contact irritants. And so they mapped out at this big grid on my back okay. and uh, they, they told me, don't worry about that. Any of means keep taking them. Okay. And um, and then put all these patches on my back, but they were on there for days. So they were mm -hmm. like, um, it mm -hmm. was like three days. I came in, they removed the patches, take a bunch of notes, and then had me come back a couple of days later. So the whole process mm -hmm. took a week. Mm -hmm. And that did reveal um, glutrol, uh, which is like a, 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 a industrial detergent that's used in okay. all these weird different uses. Mm -hmm. And uh, that did turn up as something I had a sensitivity to. And it's the first okay. time I've ever had a like an allergy show up. Because mm -hmm. I, I had allergy tests during my period of remission, yeah. uh, just to be sure, because I knew what I'd done before wasn't very valid, uh, yeah. and nothing showed up. So I, I, but that one did, and and to be safe, I, I just did a search of you know what products might contain it, and when I was getting to the very end of my hive experience, because everything was working, mm -hmm. I was still getting them on my thighs, like the back of my thighs, and on my mm -hmm. butt a little bit, and I thought like, why am I getting them there? It's consistent, whereas before they were random and they were everywhere, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I thought well. It might be this gluterol maybe in my detergent so i switched to like a an eco detergent that didn't have any chemicals in it and that really accelerated the process and then i was clear shortly after that like it's probably a couple of weeks after but it really helped so it was right. i wouldn't say a trigger there's no yeah. way that would would have been my trigger but it definitely wasn't irritant so yeah. removing that yeah. was a was a big help so the patch test was interesting yeah, for sure. And and I think that's where a lot of people go to anyway, the first time. And But I've seen so many people in the group saying, like, I've been to the allergist and I come up with nothing that I'm allergic to, right? And that's really confusing for so many people because I think most of the, pe most of the doctors are testing for an immediate response allergy, yes. right? And, yeah. Which is not, that's an IgE antibody response, right. right? And that's what you have with this gluten, whatever chemical and that's what I have with nickel and I have with grass pollen and I have with a bunch of other things but even now even with an allergy to grass pollen and birch pollen and all of that I can go outside and still be okay and not come up in hives or you know anaphylactic <laughs> breathing whatever right because my bucket is so empty now that my body can handle a couple of things coming in yeah so the IgG is what I want to talk about, and that's the delayed sensitivity. It's an, also an antibody, and we have IgA as well. So IgG and IgA together can account for about 70 or 80 percent of our immune response. IgE accounts for like 1 percent of our immune response, and not many doctors or allergists are checking for IgG and IgA because they say that your immune system is creating antibodies all the time which is true to an extent, but if you're always creating lots of antibodies, that's when you want to start paying attention. So that's where your IgG test was useful because I don't know if you had it. I mean, there are so many different ones out there where you have like a red, okay, you're yeah. really high on these IgG and maybe an orange band and a yellow band and a green band. And so, yeah. and then you really isolate the red and maybe orange. And those are the ones that you try and, keep out of your diet yeah yeah that's exactly uh what it was 
Yeah, and uh, and those those items, it's funny. In my during my period of remission, I I could have them no problem, but yeah. uh, but there's no way I could have them like with the high thing, and yeah. and that delayed sensitivity. I mean, talk about a frustrating thing for people to manage because it's exactly. impossible to make the connection to it. Mm -hmm, like you mm -hmm. you'd have to be tested for it because yeah. It's, it's, it is really it might difficult. be the next day or three yeah. days later. Three days later, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's yeah. anywhere between two and seventy-two hours, though, and that's what makes it notoriously difficult for people to pinpoint their own IgGs, which is why I think, and I think a lot of people in the groups are might have heard of these things called elimination diets, and so they elimination diets take out the top seven or eight IgG sensitivities people that, that people do respond to. And that gluten and dairy at the top. So dairy anyway, being a histamine mediator, histamine mediator is going to be at the top of the, the uh, list for people who respond with hives. But gluten, we say anyway, needs to come out, whether it comes up on your IgG or not, because of the way it irritates the gut lining. Because gluten contains that... Um, protein called gliadine which is very difficult to break down and so if it's if your body's struggling to break down to it uh, break it down it's going to eventually start responding to it and so that's why we take it out yeah it, it's really interesting stuff and and you know when i think back to your your bucket analogy right it, it all comes together it makes so much sense because you're just you're just filling that bucket and you're not aware of when you reach the top and you know like mm -hmm. you, you don't know mm -hmm. where the level is and when i think back to when the hive started because I've, I've played this game so many times. Like what, <laughs> why did it start? And I go yeah. through all this stuff. There's psychological factors, you know, there's, there's diet, there's all this stuff. But, um, you know, there are connections to foods on my IgG list. You know, like when, when things first started back in the 90s, my wife and I had uh, got a bread machine. Do you remember when those were? The, oh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Like that was a cool. big thing. Like <laughs> you know, 20 years ago, they came out and everybody had a bread machine. Well, we were eating bread like every day. So good right homemade bread in my bread machine yeah. uh i wonder if that was connected you know the second time around i was eating almonds all the time because i read some health article about the benefits mm -hmm, of almonds mm -hmm. and i love them so i was like i can mm -hmm. eat almonds every day and i yeah. had them on my desk and i wonder you know i think for for me and probably for a lot of people with hives it's a combination of factors that sets it off like and and maybe just overfilling it, the bucket you know yeah yeah but um but i when i think back to the you know, the connection to foods on that IgG list, there's definitely something there. You know? Yeah, yeah. I'm glad that you brought that up because also I think this this whole idea of eating something every single day is mm. what um, can also start causing a food sensitivity to a particular food, especially if you already have a compromised gut microbiome, okay? And so all of these foods that you're eating every single day, it, your body, because your immune system is sitting on the other side of your gut lining, and now it's permeable, what we call leaky gut, it's seeing a lot more stuff coming through and the immune system says, hey, this stuff is not belonging on this side of the, of the fence. You've got to go back, okay? So let's start attacking you. And that's how people develop more food sensitivities with time if they don't start to fix their gut. And it happened with you with almonds, but it happened with me with, with eggs. So when I went gluten and dairy free, what I was doing, I was eating a lot of eggs. <laughs> uh, right. You know, because you don't have the gluten to bind things. So I was making maybe um, pancakes or muffins or whatever, like right. with eggs all the time. Right. And so I was eating eggs pretty much every day. And then the hives came back and then I thought, oh, but I've taken out gluten. I've taken out dairy. Now what do I do? And I went to a different kind of um, naturopath, a kinesiologist, and she tested me. Um, it was one of these bioresonance tests where you're holding like a copper thing and it's reading the frequency oh. through your body. I don't know if you've heard of that. It's kind of woo-woo, but I thought, okay, I'll give it a shot. And she said eggs. So um, I took out eggs and they went away. So, yeah. And now oh, I can eat eggs on occasion, like once or twice a week but not more than that if i eat it every day they'll come back so wow. yeah but this uh, is a great process of learning how your body responds to different things and that when you do break out that you know what to do so you've already figured out what you did that worked and that when you when you break out again you can go back to the things that worked and implement yeah. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, I did. I did a lot of journaling when I was mm -hmm. going through, and mm -hmm. uh, that really helped spot the multi-day kind of trends. Mm 
Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and now I feel like, yeah, I've got kind of a good map. And it, it was funny putting together that, that video was, um, you know, it was, it was driven by, you know, a, a desire to just share because I found what worked for me, but it was also selfish in that I needed a way to record it so mm -hmm. that I could come back to it <laughs> yeah, because yeah. I've already fallen into that trap where you're in remission for so many years that you forget because the devil is in the details, right? It's all these little things like, you know, I like meat have, having to be so fresh. If you're going to eat, yeah. it's got to be so fresh. And there's all kinds of little details to that, right? Like, yeah. like you can't have ground beef because, you know, the, the, the bacteria is on the surface of the meat and that's producing and that's, the histamine. Yeah, and huge surface area. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Then, so ground beef doesn't work. And then, oh, and then beef doesn't work because I learned that, you know, beef is always aged, like always. They okay. age it for 14 mm -hmm. days, no matter what. So the mm -hmm. only way to eat beef is to essentially get it from a farmer and he's going to look at you like you're crazy because, you know, you don't, you don't eat it right away after slaughter. <laughs> so yeah, like all these little details that make all the difference because it's, if it's not, you know, perfect yeah. as yeah. far as the diet, yeah. it doesn't work. You get one yeah. little food in there that keeps yeah. it going, mm -hmm. it'll keep it going. So. Well, that's what I say also to my clients because this whole gluten and dairy thing is like, can I, can I have just a little bit like, yeah, a little bit of cream, <laughs> yeah. a little bit of cream oh, in my coffee that. or something? <laughs> oh, that's but it. Like, if you really want to get rid of them and you want to be sure, then you've got to do this a hundred percent. You know, yeah, that's that is so true, and it's the hardest thing because you want to cheat. And yeah. the problem is because I, I I'm a huge like foodie like doing this diet was not fun or easy for me I really sure. struggled but yeah. oh my goodness like you you cheat and and you have that piece of cheese or whatever it is like it's a week before mm -hmm. you're back mm -hmm. from that mm -hmm. yeah. well I'll tell you the truth you know so an antibody's half-life is about 23 days so you wow. eat something that your body doesn't like it creates an antibody that lives for 23 days that antibody the, the amount of antibodies, say you create 100 antibodies to this food, it goes down to 50 after 23 days. It only goes down to 25 after another 20, uh, 23 days, and then down to 12 and a half after another 23 days. So you almost at three months by the time you get to near <laughs> zero, and then if you're eating it in between. So, so we say, yeah. like, you've got to go strict for at least three to four months. Yeah, yeah, I, I believe it. That, that was my experience. Uh, yeah. Because it, 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 one little cheat would just, it would be a setback. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why it takes so long, like in my experience, because I, I, you know, it's, it's hard to apply that kind of discipline, especially when you're, you're busy, right? And, and you've got all the stressors of life to deal with, and you, you're living in a house with a family who's baking a cake. <laughs> you know, you like, get invited you to a birthday party or, um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's yeah. not easy. But I'd say if you're able to control a large part of it, the stuff that is not in your control, if you do happen to be gluten or dairy, mm, might might not make so much of a difference. But you've got to yeah. control as much as you can during yeah. those that period. Yeah. Yeah. I, I found like the, the, the most challenging period was when you start to improve. Because that's that's when you feel like you can cheat. Yeah, and yeah, really exactly. And it really slows mm -hmm. your progress down. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, that's the hardest part. And the, the other thing I would say too, uh, the, the, I, I got the um, the DOA supplements. DAO, really, yeah. Or, sorry, mm -hmm. thank you. They they really um, helped in those later stages because okay, um, just they were keep. pretty. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like they were effective at taking the histamine out of foods. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. only for high histamine foods, but they mm -hmm. really did allow for some cheating, and mm -hmm, they, it, mm -hmm. it did help. In, in the short term, it was, I found those were really quite remarkable how well they worked. Yeah, so do you want to talk about the, the supplements that you used, how long you used them for? Because I know there was a question in, that got emailed to me. So um, how many of them are you, are you taking? Any of them now still? And how long did you take them for? Which ones did you take? Yeah, I'm going to actually pull up my list because um, there was a bunch. And, and they were different ones were doing different things, you know? So um, as far as uh, just histamine load overall, bringing that level in the bucket down, um, quercetin uh, was a big one. Uh, the D-O-A. A-O, D-A-O. A-O, I'm gonna always get that wrong. What's a quercetin? I've actually not heard come across this quercetin one. Uh, quercetin, uh, Q... Oh, quercetin, sorry, quercetin. Yeah, yeah absolutely. It's, an, it's a natural antihistamine. 
Yeah, yeah, and it it uh, is uh, what it, the way it was described to me is it's uh, it's part of the, um, the the chemical chain that makes up the enzyme that takes apart and and gets rid of the histamine in your bloodstream. So it helps support that whole process. Okay. Um, <laughs> vitamin D uh, yeah. was was part of it. Um, I was prescribed four thousand international units a day. I ended up taking three thousand because I felt that was working pretty well. And, you know, I'm all, I'm all about the minimal effective dose of anything. Yeah, you know? yeah. Um, there was a uh, zinc was part of it. Um, something called Guducci. And that's just an immune mod modulator. Okay, um, how many how many zinc uh, milligrams did you take? 10, 15, 20? Uh, so I was remember. taking I was taking a product from AOR uh, called zinc copper balance. Oh, that's a good uh, one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, I was taking one of those a day, but how, what was the actual, it doesn't say on this paper that I have what the actual um, dosage was, but it was one AOR zinc copper balance okay. uh, a day. Yeah, it's good actually. And while you're on that topic, um, zinc should not be taken for a longer period on its own because it works in balance with copper that's why that zinc copper balances or that zinc copper combination is a good one because okay. then you're not throwing your copper out of balance as well okay yeah. um so the um the the naturopath i was working with he he i connected to him because he he wrote an article that i found that was all about this imbalance that can happen between th1 and th2 uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. cells yep. in the body and um and, you know, you read a lot about different theories, but I talked about uh, that with my immunologist and he said, yeah, there's something there. He said, we don't understand it yet. But his, um, his clinic was actually in the middle of a, uh, a trial with a drug that was uh, intended to, to address that. So, mm -hmm. and there's a lot, like in, if you get into the, um, the journals right now, there's a lot uh, of, of research happening on TH1, TH2. So, um, so the other supplements were all about bringing things into balance there. So, uh, astrologus, um, mm -hmm. taking NFH astrologus, uh, there was two, two of those three times a day. There, there was a lot of those. Um, and that's, uh, just supposed to, uh, help bring that, you know, that balance into place. Uh, there was another immune modulator doing roughly the same thing, uh, uh something called Guducci. Mm -hmm. um, and then there was a specific one called uh, T-Balance pH. So restorative formulations, T-Balance pH. I was taking two capsules there. And, uh, and again, that one's uh, all about addressing that, uh, that balance. And, and then beyond that, it was probiotics because um, I did a, um, uh, a stool uh, analysis. And, uh, and actually what was cool is I did that while I was covered in hives as part of his initial discovery process. And then I went ahead and did it again after I was in remission because I wanted to see the difference. And one of, one of the major differences before and after was gut flora. And uh, so the probiotics made a big difference. And, uh, and so that was just a general, um, you know, overall gut health kind of a thing. Um, I, I took two, one was, um, HMF Forte, um, which is just a sort of a generalized sort of thing. And then there was another one I had that was um, more specific to um, histamines. Uh, it, was, it was supposed to be bacteria that are, you know, producing antihistamines on their own kind of thing. It was called uh, Histamine X. Uh, took that one for a little bit, but mostly it was just the general ones. And uh, the only other thing was uh, stinging nettle tea. Um, you know, just as a natural antihistamine, I found that quite effective. I was, uh, so I had that um, three times a day and that was um, steeped for a half an hour as well. That was, that was one of the things like really letting it sit in the mug. Yeah, and that's a great one because stinging nettle also is really great for the immune system and, and also for your liver. So it really helps with detoxification. So it's probably helping that, that drainage part as well. Mm -hmm. Cool, cool. Yeah. yeah, but that was, but that was it. Um, yeah, I think uh, the, the, the TH1, TH2 is really interesting because I, I, I had I tried that at different points mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. uh, I really found that um, relative to not having it, it really accelerated the 
um, the progress. So that may and which, part which particular me. supplement was that that was modulating your Th1, Th2 response? Yeah, it was called the T Balance PX. T Balance, yeah. yeah T Balance PX, and it's from a company called uh, Restorative Formulations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, oh, so I realized I'm I missed that. one. I also showed there was a, a parasite um, showing in the the, the in the store well. Oh, really? Okay, which one yeah, did you have? Ah, uh, that would, I'd have to, uh, see if I can remember the name, uh, blast, blasto. Blasto is dishominance, yeah, blasto is a common one. Mm -hmm. But, um, so I took a, a, a supplement called Canabactin, I think it was. Candybactin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, uh, but what was interesting is that was still showing in the after. Uh, okay. So I don't think it was a big driver of the hives for me. Yeah, uh, so what we see, what I see, Often see because I do a stool sample on all my clients as well because the gut health is so important and and the balance between your own um, endemic flora and opportunistic bacteria as well as whether you've got any parasites viruses or other infections um, you know come up or on the stool sample as well as the one that I like most the the stool test also shows quality of your intestinal health so like how well are you digesting your food and and are you absorbing, how well are you absorbing your food? Because that's that's the other thing that I see a lot is people eating great diets, but um, they're just not bringing on the nutrients. So that's also a topic. But the parasites usually, I mean, because we've got, we've got this, hmm, a good blocker to, to help us prevent um, infection from things like parasites or other infections or bacteria. And that's called our stomach acid, because if it's strong enough, it's going to kill all of that stuff if it's coming in from up here, right? And so usually if you've got also a good gut balance, the parasites would tend to be forced out sometimes if there's, you know, um, a decent enough balance or that there's no possibility of reinfection if you've got strong enough stomach acid. But so you never retested to see um, if you still have it. Uh, so that the, the retest was fairly recent. It was, oh, it was uh, just yeah, and uh, while in remission, and it was uh, it, it's at a kind of a low level, mm -hmm. but it but it is there, like it's, okay. it's just kind of showing. So uh, I just actually started taking the kenobactin again, just to yeah. I I have the the, the pills, so I figure I'll use them up and, and yeah. see if it, uh, but uh, but it doesn't seem to be. Like right now, I'm in complete remission, and um, I, I don't have like even a sign of hives. And, and mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. I've gone completely back to you know old old habits on diet. Like I'm, I'm, Sorry, I'm okay. kind of eating whatever I I'm want. Everyone's jealous of you. <laughs> oh, it's it's unbelievable the difference. I I don't take it for granted at all. Like uh, it's it's such a it's such a horrible condition to to put up with and and have to live with um and it, the, the difference in in just life for me is is night and day being in remission just just to have a glass of wine and, and a pizza like oh yeah. man you know yeah that's uh for for somebody like me who, who like probably enjoys that way more than he should it's, <laughs> it's, it's a real um, it, it's it's really something yeah, well, the beauty of going through a journey like this is learning to read your body, right? And then knowing when you've overstepped the mark. Yeah, that's that's very true. In fact, it will you know, tell the, you straight away, right? Yeah, the, the biggest learning for me was the stress side of things because mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I, uh, you know, although I do believe stress was a huge part of of my hive issue, um, and based on everything that I learned and so forth. I, I, I'm not somebody who was aware of their stress, uh, but you know, my, my wife would say, you know, you're, you're really stressed out because look at what you're doing, you know? Wow. Um, okay. So I, I kind of learned to, um, to, to sort of, sort of look at what I was doing in life and say, is this stressful? You know, like if I evaluate this as uh, you know, a person looking at the situation, not my situation, but is this something somebody would find stressful? I've kind of learned to look at it that way because I'm not aware of the stress. Like I don't mm -hmm. feel stressed mm -hmm. out, mm -hmm. but it's very typical for me to, um, you know, to work, you know, a 60 hour work week and then work all weekend on some projects at home, you know, and, yeah. and I just never take a break because I, I just don't like taking breaks, but you, mm -hmm. you need them. <laughs> and this, is, this yeah. is what I've learned, you know, so, uh, so forcing that into yeah. my life, I think has made a huge difference. So, I mean, while we're on that topic, let, 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 let's explore that on, from your perspective. So you have just said that you're not the kind of person who notices that they're really stressed, but your body was 
experiencing it in some way. So how do you now um, manage stress if you're not the kind of person that notices that you're under stress? <laughs> yeah, so my big strategy <clears throat> has been essentially not to put too much on my plate. And that, that, that's what I, that's the big change that I made mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, because um, it's, uh, it's sort of like if, if I, if I, if I give myself stuff to do, I'll just go do it and I won't notice that I've, I'm overworking things. So uh, I used to, I used to create these big long lists of things, you know, so I have this, this sheet of goals for the year that I'm trying to get accomplished. And then I got my to-do lists that are all categorized. I'm one of those people. And so I I'll think just, there are a lot do, like that. <laughs> yeah, a lot of yeah. a lot of folks are. So I have a really busy job. It's, it's mm -hmm. just a, a you know a, a busy pace and uh, not a lot of control because we're servicing uh, different clients and there's a lot of urgency to stuff and fires that come up and so so the weeks are kind of kind of crazy. They're long days and they're like there's days where I'm I'm presenting all day long. You know, like for you know twelve hours it's just meeting to meeting to meeting to meeting and. And, you know, speaking and, and doing things that are, you know, stressful. But then, you know, wrapping that up on a Friday, I go, okay, so what's my list for the mm -hmm. weekend? Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. I'm planning out, okay, mm -hmm. so I'm going to start the day here and I'm going to do this and that and the other thing. And, and then, you know, Sunday night rolls around and, you know, I, I haven't sat to watch a movie or I haven't, you know relaxed and, and that kind of thing so it's just too much of that so so basically the strategy now is I, I i'll make the list but then i'll go well let's cut this in half because i'm, I'm not okay. going to do all these things i'm going to make sure and I'm, I'm putting relaxed time into the calendar now okay oh, making a yeah. point in the evening of just sitting with my my wife to just just sit chat have, yeah. have, a, have, a, have a glass of wine we can do that now that's nice mm -hmm. um not every night because that yeah. hurts but <laughs> Um, yeah, like just uh, like making it okay to sit there and watch a movie, you know, to yeah, just sit yeah. there together and watch the news, like just just taking those moments to relax. We started walking every morning. Very good. Yeah. And mm -hmm. that was that was well, probably one of the best things I did. Just that morning walk, you know, mm -hmm. just to mm -hmm. start the day fresh, almost like a little forest bath, you know. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, stuff like that. Good advice. Yeah. Do you still meditate? Because I think you mentioned that in your in your YouTube videos that you do some meditation? Uh, so meditation, <laughs> um, it, it, I, I would say it's probably the most important thing I do. Um, mm -hmm. So when I see hives come back, I snap right back to the meditation because I feel like it's, and, and this is where things get probably a little funny for me, but I feel like there's this real connection between the, the brain and the skin, you know, just, and I have a total lay person's understanding of this, but uh, but I've just seen case study after case study in the stuff that I've read. Like my, my brother, for example, hates heights just like I do. And he got on his roof to, to make a repair. And when he climbed down, his arms were covered in hives. Wow. Mm -hmm. he, mm -hmm. he doesn't get hives, you know, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. just the stress of it, you know, if there's just this connection, if you're embarrassed, you blush. If you're scared, yeah. your yeah. skin will bristle. Like there's a yeah. connection there. Absolutely. Um, mm -hmm. And I feel like um, not only did the meditation reduce stress, but the meditation I was doing was all about visualizing clear skin. The mantra was like, you know, uh, my skin is clear. And there's something about the brain directing the body that works. And, uh, and so I, I found it to be very powerful. Um, so both the meditation and the hypnosis were doing the same thing. Um, the problem with meditation, as anybody knows, when you're, when you're trying to do it, it's, it's, it's hard to stick to because it needs to be, you need to be focused. It needs to be quiet in the house. It, you know, there's a lot of factors that work against it. So unfortunately for me, it's one of the first things that falls when okay. uh, mm -hmm. I get into remission because it's hard to make time for it. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So it's the most important thing. And I wish I could keep it going because I know the health benefits, yeah. but um, it's, it's just hard to keep going. So I've kind of traded meditation for workouts. Mm -hmm. That's kind of okay. where I ended up. Yeah. I, I wasn't working out as much before because of the pressure, like, uh, like, mm -hmm. you know, it just, it would, it would like the weightlifting would, would annoy the hives a bit. Yeah. Um, but uh, so more mild exercise was great. But now that I have that meditation time back, I'm kind of using it for, for working out. Yeah. Cool. Okay. So have we, have we addressed the three, I think there were three videos and kind of three pillars of, of your approach. Is that kind of sum up, um, everything that you did in terms of yeah. addressing yeah. the hives? I, th I think so. Yeah, it's basically the the, the diet 
and then the strategies around controlling how reactive I was mm -hmm. and then the stress piece and those, those yeah. are sort of the, the three. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, 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 perfect. So there were a couple of questions from the people in the groups and so I'm just going to read them off and we can both respond to them as it um, comes up. Um, so where is this particular one? I know that Sharon asked and she said that she couldn't make it. So her question is here. Well, let me just, yeah. She said, I've tried cutting out gluten, dairy and such, but never seem to know how long to leave it out of my diet. My hives are only occasional now and I've cut back on meds considerably. How long would I need to leave gluten out as I really don't want to go totally gluten free? <laughs> uh, yeah, I can relate to that. Yeah, we can I, all. <laughs> yeah, I, I grew up with a mother that used to bake you know, this beautiful bread every week and the whole house just smelled <laughs> like it, it was so good. So yeah, it's, it's, uh, I can so relate. Um, the, uh, so for me, it was different every time because I've, I've gotten into remission like, like a couple of times, right? Three, three or four times into complete remission over, over the years. Um, and it was different every time um, and, and took longer more recently because of like, I think life stress was, was greater and, and age and so forth. You talk about the bucket, you know, just being a little harder to empty probably now, mm -hmm. but um, the way I, I can only talk to my experience, but the way I did it was I didn't allow any cheating until I was like right down to nothing. And I was really hardcore about that because I went wrong that way several times. <laughs> so, so what I did was I waited till I got to a point where I wasn't seeing any hives, like, like zero and wasn't taking any medication. And that took, um, I would say anywhere between like, like four months maybe to, to five, um, so a while. And then I would introduce it very uh, strategically. So I would, I would be, you know, I would go really super strict and I would on a Wednesday morning or whatever, have that bread and I'd have it again and I'd have it again, like for the day. So I had a lot of it, you know, maybe three or four slices over the course of the day. And then I'd go back to the, the diet and just see if it had an impact. And then if it didn't, I'd have it a little bit more and just see. And I was very surgical about it, like coming out of an elimination diet, essentially. Exactly. Yeah, I was just going to say, I mean, it's so exact, the description of how you reintroduce the food after doing a full elimination diet. So once you've taken out a food for a period of three to four months and you want to test whether your body still responds to it, you do exactly that. You introduce it in volume over two days. And then you take a break on the third day and the fourth day and just see how your body responds. So, yeah. And so all I did was, you know, I made a list of my favorites, right? Yeah. So it was like, I was really missing. Whichever you really missed. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And the bread and, and a couple other things. And I would just do that. And then, you know, once I knew that it was okay, I wasn't going whole hog into just eating them all the time. I would just allow it here and there, you know? And, uh, and then that's been fine. And, 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 you know, now I don't think twice about it and I just kind of eat what I want, but I, I guess, I guess I do pay attention realistically. Like I'm trying to eat healthy overall. So I'm not having gluten anyway. Like I, I'll have yeah. it if it makes sense, if it's worth it. If know, it's I'll, worth I'll it. it. Exactly. Right. I mean, I think that's where I am now as well. So I generally don't eat gluten or dairy unless there's an occasion like a birthday or whatever. And I feel like this cake is really worth it for me and I'm going to eat it. And, and you, I, I won't respond. I mean, I know my body by now that I don't respond to them. But if I do it over a couple of days, like we've just had a holiday, you know, summer vacation. And I technically have done it before where I do three or four days in a row because you're at a at a catered hotel or whatever it might be and you know the food looks so good and <laughs> yeah. yeah but then you start to notice slight symptoms coming back might not be a hive but I notice it in just the irregularity of the the, the feeling of my skin so I get yes. what they call gluten pimples I think they, they look like chicken skin it's oh, like it's like having goosebumps almost 
Yeah. But they're not cold, not from the cold or anything like they're just like little bumps. And that that's my first sign that, you know, I'm, I'm overdoing it. Yeah, I have the same thing. It's not it's not um, actually raised bumps on the skin. It's just a, a feeling, a sensation. Yeah. Like my mm -hmm. skin is just kind of I feel it and I mm -hmm. never felt it before. I feel it now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's a mm -hmm. sure sign of, OK, I'm getting carried away. It's too much red wine, too much <laughs> pizza, whatever. Yeah, yeah, totally. It's like pre it's like almost like a slight itch. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, for sure. Good one. Okay, so there was another question that came in via email, and um, that was that was relating to the supplements. So hopefully, Sarah, I mean Claire, you're online. So if you if we didn't answer your question properly with regards to the supplements, just write in the chat. Um, but she also asked, um, when you determine you are in need of your rescue protocol, because that you speak about is not in your YouTube video. How long do you plan for? Weeks or months of restricted eating and supplements? What time frame should I have in mind? And are there any other medical or personal metrics that indicate success and you can return to a fuller diet? Yeah, so I, I would say what if I've learned anything over the years, it's that I have to go, get into it right away. Like I got to react right away. If I see a hive on me, I've got to go back into the whole protocol immediately. Because if I do that, I'll only have to do it for a week, like maybe, maybe two weeks. And, and then it'll just clear up and it'll be fine. But that's everything, the meditation, the diet, the, you know, uh, the, the supplements, all that stuff. Um, it, 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 most recently, four, it was four years ago where I didn't pay attention to it. And it just ramped up and ramped up, ramped up. And then I was in for like a real long haul. Like, and, and then it would take months, like, like the four or five months to, to ramp it down. So, <clears throat> yeah, yeah it, it can resolve quickly if it's a really small outbreak. And, uh, but my experience is once it, once it really takes hold <clears throat> and you've got hives like in, in significant quantity, it, it takes, I would say at least a couple months, two, three months. Yeah. Because, because to your bucket analogy, right? Like it's happening because the bucket's full. Yeah, And, and exactly. it takes time to clear that bucket. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Exactly. And all of those strategies, uh, you know, help reduce the load in the bucket. And that's why, you know, from our perspective, we're, we're looking continuously at what is possibly going to be filling that bucket. Is it a food sensitivity? Are there toxins in our environment? So when I speak with clients, I'm looking into the entire history of whether they've been exposed to metal, you know, whether they've got amalgams in their teeth, um, are, you know, are they drinking out of plastic bottles still? Um, you know, all of these kinds of lifestyle changes that in the long run, you should just keep out. So you stop eating pesticide laden food if you can so start buying more organic food so that you're not adding more poison at least to fill the bucket right and yeah. start being more aware of your whole mind state and your stress response because that's you know going to also help you manage at least maybe have a bigger bucket so that you can manage more right um and then again, looking at gut health, because infections will fill the bucket really quickly and a parasite too, you know, so maybe your parasite is just not filling the bucket much for you, but it's there. It's probably a little right. part of your bucket. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's something I should deal with. <laughs> just yeah. to get it out of the mix. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. I think that there's always a combination of mm -hmm. factors, at least Absolutely. in my case, it's set it off. Yeah. 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 And I think for everybody, it's different. So, I mean, Everyone can start with a low histamine diet just to start reducing the burden, but it's not a long-term, it's not the long-term thing. You don't have to be on a low histamine diet forever. What you really need to do is start also helping the drainage, help clear the histamines, look at your gut mm -hmm. health, and really address, in general, a healthy diet as well. You need to be eating a healthy diet so that your body can deal with these things. So there was another question come in, at, in the chat. Let's see. Are the hives the only indicator? I feel I have a greater fatigue with hives. Did you have fatigue, Scott? Uh, not, not that stood out to me. <clears throat> not, not that I, I, I noticed, but I would say um, with the hives comes crazy fatigue uh, because, and, and I would chalk that up to the stress. Like, so with this question, yeah, it's interesting. There's almost a chicken and an egg factor, I think here, because um, hives are it, it, it's funny I had a couple people over the journey right ask me you know so you know do you experience a lot of stress in your life I'm like well the single biggest stressor in my life is these hives mm -hmm, mm -hmm, <laughs> you know yeah. and 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 fatigue is like number one symptom of stress so I think anybody who's suffering with hives is going to be tired all the time because it 
drains your spirit. Like it's just awful. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I, I didn't notice it as being something uh, that was a precursor uh, to, to hives, but I definitely noticed it while I had them. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a great question, Claire, because also I, what I've noticed in the groups is that there are so many people who are not only experiencing the hives as a symptom, they have other symptoms like fatigue, like another autoimmune disease, which is very, very common. People with hives and autoimmune, it's just like Hashimoto's, like one of the most common combination, hives and Hashimoto's. I don't know why, but I mean, anyway, we're dealing with immune system issues. So it is possible if you don't deal with the hives that you can develop, it's possible you could develop an autoimmune as well, or vice versa, that one of your autoimmune symptoms might be hives. So, um, Fatigue, I would certainly look at thyroid. Um, if I'm thinking about fatigue as a symptom, thinking about thyroid health, thinking about your nutrients and in general nutrient deficiencies. So we're thinking about iron. Um, yeah, any of those that might be addressing your fatigue, but also we would be having to look at your stress as Scott says, you know, cause that is a real drain on the body's energy and as well as any Thing else that might be affecting mitochondrial health because mitochondria are energy powerhouses and they are very susceptible to toxins, external toxins. So people who are exposed to external things like mold or heavy metals, they often have this feeling of fatigue and brain fog. So yeah, it's quite involved and that's one thing that I would really like to express to everybody is just to pay attention to what other symptoms you have, because I don't know about you, Scott, whether you had any other symptoms apart from the hives, but the symptoms are going to be our clues as to whether our body is feeling is, is really healthy or not. So if you're experiencing any chronic pain, any chronic headaches, things that people live with, so chronic fatigue, chronic headaches, chronic joint pain, a lot of people, or even bloating, gas, indigestion, reflux. These are things that a lot of people are living with and taking a pull for and saying, okay, it's, it's normal, this is my life. <laughs> I just pop a pill and then it's gone and I get on with my life. But no, your body's actually saying something to you. And the hives is a very ex external expression of your body talking to you but there are a lot of other symptoms that we should be listening to as well. That's really interesting because it's amazing how you can come to habituate to something and, mm -hmm. and not take it as information anymore. You know, like it's just, yeah, it's just this thing. Yeah. You know? And you wouldn't even mention it to a doctor because you're just so used to it. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm just reminded of one of the very common questions that we pose is like, how are your bowel movements? And most people say normal. So we ask, what is normal for you? And so what is normal? Right. I'm going to ask you, Scott, okay? It's national TV. <laughs> You're live on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> What's normal for you? Mm -hmm. So for, for bowel movements for me, uh, it's pretty pretty regular uh, daily. And, and it was during the, the hive adventure as well. So no real as well. change So there. once a day is regular for you? Or what is it? Once a day, twice a day? Yeah, once a day. Once a day. Okay. Uh, pretty, and, pretty typical. Yeah. And so a lot of people feel uncomfortable talking about the whole topic, but, you know, that is part of our elimination, you know, elimination right. of, of things. And if, if our drainage is not working well, these toxins are going to be building up. So for some people, normal is like once a week. Wow. So, or, yeah, rocks. That's normal, <laughs> you know. Right, yeah. <laughs> I had yeah. like there's another there's another uh, lady called Terry Walls that coaches um, MS reversal of MS, and she she talks about rocks, logs, pudding, <laughs> or tea. <laughs> <laughs> okay, right, perfect. <laughs> yeah. So. That's funny. But yeah, um, I think those were all the questions. Are there any other questions from those that are online um, for Scott or myself? Let's just see um, if there are any other questions online here. Yeah. I don't see anything on Facebook. And I don't see anything here in the chat. 
So it sounds like we've addressed most of the questions. So what we Great. can do, Scott, um, yeah, I don't know if you want to be available in the group and if people want to just drop their questions as well, and you can just respond to them at the bottom of the thread. Yeah, but, yeah, um, yeah for sure, for sure. And, and that the, the group that you have, <clears throat> I would say is, uh, uh, it, 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 you've really got something great there. I've, I've, I've had membership in many groups over, over the years, and um, I really love how you're positioning everything in that group. And the, you know, the, the discussion there is of, of a very high quality, I would say, uh, relative to a lot of other places where we're, there's just like an endless spin on what medication, what medication, what medication, yeah. because the yeah. answer, the answer is just not there. Like it's, no. mm -hmm. I've, I've been down every single road, you know, on, on that over 20 some odd years. It's um, so I really love your group and what you're doing there. So, so thanks for, uh, thanks for doing that. Cause it was a big part of, of my recovery, right? The information and the connections there. So, so thank you. Oh. Yeah. I appreciate that, Scott, because that's really what we want to do is we want people to know firstly that, even though your doctor or allergist, whoever says that, you know, all you can do is take the antihistamines or steroids, no, there is another way. And you are proof, I'm proof, there are several other people in the group that are proof. Um, and you just need to go down this, on this journey and start figuring it out what it is for you. A large part of it is diet. And as we've discussed, a large part of it is emotional health as well. So, yeah. Yeah, it, it's really interesting. I've um, since posting the videos into some of the other groups. I've I've now heard from people that tried it because it's been now a couple of weeks, right? Or mm -hmm. weeks. and I've heard from a couple of people now that have said, "Oh man, this this works!" Like yeah, you know, a, a two years have been covered in hives, and now I'm completely high free. Yeah, uh, and it's mm -hmm. you know it's 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 not easy, but it's it's simple. You know, you're it's it's easy to to. To, to follow the, the stuff, it just takes diligence and a little, little willpower. But man, I mean, anybody who's had hives knows that, uh, yeah. you know. It's not worse than, the, yeah, it's <laughs> worse than the hives itself because that's pretty, exactly. yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Perfect. Well, thanks so much for your time, Scott. It was great chatting to you. Much prefer yeah, chatting to pleasure. somebody than just talking to a screen. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, well, happy happy to chat anytime, of course. And and for anybody in the group or anybody who's watching this, if you if you have questions for me, hit me up on Facebook. I'll I'll, I'll respond and uh, happy happy to help. And uh, really appreciate the time. Uh, really enjoy the chat and you know, glad we could do this. Cool. All right. So I'm going to stop the recording.